I'm going to be reading from Exodus 17, verses 1 through 7. It's on page 52 of your pew Bible. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock and thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will be standing there in front of you um, on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Before we read the scripture today, let's get a look at what happens before this in the book of John. Today we're going to have a little bit of a Bible study. Okay. Now we're only in chapter 4 right now, but a lot has already happened. First comes John the Baptist to proclaim the birthright of Jesus, so he declares Jesus to be the Lamb of God. Then Jesus collects a few Gal Galilee's uh, followers. Then there's a wedding at Cana. There's a miracle where Jesus turns the water into wine. Then he heads to the temple. He throws out all the money changers for doing business in the temple. How dare they? Then he encounters Nicodemus, we discussed last week, a wealthy man with a lot of political influence. And he seems to have an effect on him, he understands him. And thereby, because he has an effect on Nicodemus, he gets a follower in the wings. Now, Jesus has moved to Judea, where he spends simple time with the disciples, just teaching and baptizing people. It seems to be kind of like an R&R &R time, lots of teaching and simple conversions. Then this, John 4. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself but the disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee, but he had to go through Samaria. Let's stop there for just a moment. Jesus hears that people don't necessarily want him around, so he leaves. Many Jews would not have chosen to go through Samaria at all. They would have taken a longer, safer route across Jordan to avoid Samaria. The animosity between Samaritans and Jews started in the divided monarchy of 920 BCE, quite a while before this encounter. And notice the text says this, Jesus had to go through Samaria. Why? Why did he have to go through Samaria? Other Jews most certainly did not. Well, this is a political gesture and a theological one. He needed to get out of Judea quickly, and the news was spreading about him, and it wasn't favorable. His time to be fully revealed wasn't, hadn't come yet, so he moved on. But he didn't move on to a safer place. He chose one that was ripe for the taking. So Jesus and his disciples journeyed into Samaria and the village of Zachar. Here's the text again. So he came to a Samaritan city called Zachar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a, Samaritan, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Let's stop and dig again. This dialogue very early between Jesus and the Samaritan woman with no name. Did you notice she had no name? leads me to wonder about the differences between Samaritans and Jews. Fundamental differences. Here's a note from Sherry Brown, the New Testament professor. 
By the first century CE, Samaritans held a Torah-centered faith focused on the patriarchs. They centered worship on Mount Gerizim and looked for a Messiah who would be a prophet like Moses. The Jewish people, on the other hand, held a broader scriptural tradition that included the prophets, centered their worship in Jerusalem, and looked for a Messiah king in the line of David. Although they shared the same founding history, they currently shared nothing else, including food, drink, or utensils. They didn't touch each other's stuff, kind of like today with the virus, okay? Go on this. Let's continue with the text. Jesus answered the Samaritan woman, if you knew the gift of God and who it, who it is that is saying it to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to her, sir, you have no bucket and, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us the well and with his sons and flocks that drink from it? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up eternal life. A woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to the well to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come back. Let's stop again for a moment. Jesus seems to redirect their conversation about the water with a new command. Go call your husband. So we have a fresh start here. But if we look closely, the language and that remains with him and her is one of relationship, not of contest. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you've said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on the mountain, but you say that that place where people must worship is in Jerusalem? And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what is known, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now here, and when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want, or why are you speaking with her? And the woman left, and she left her water jar, went back to the city. She left her jar. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? <clears throat> they left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But then he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. The disciples said to one another, surely no one has like, brought him something to eat, have they? Let's stop for the last time. Sherry Brown again, the New Testament professor. She breaks in. Jesus' food is to do with the will of the one who sent him. And in this case, it's to incorporate the Samaritans into relationship through the apostleship of this woman. Their label will come later as they embark upon their own ministries in his seat. Let's finish the scripture. Jesus said to the disciples, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say, four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so the sower and reaper can rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. When the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed for two days. And many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe. We've heard for ourselves and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The word of the Lord. <laughs> Jesus can 
now return to Galilee. Why? Because his soulmates come to do. He planted seeds with a witness and the land with the fields were ripe for harvesting. But not just any witness now. A Samaritan woman with no name. And according to both the Jewish and Samaritan laws, she was a sinner. Did you notice the time of day? What time of day was it? Noon. Noon. Most of the women had already collected their, their water jugs by then, or they collected them in the evening because the sun was too hot. You see, she had to come later. She was a woman living in sin and an outcast. Yet Jesus chose her. He chose her. I've been watching some PBS lately. And a story came to me a few days ago about a man who had walked through the civil rights movement of 1963 in Montgomery, Alabama. I know nothing about that time period, really. I was born in 1963, okay? And, um, and I don't know much about uh, Alabama in the South. I, I never lived in segregation. It was fascinating. He tells about how um, he, was, he was a black man. He was part of the lunch counter sit-ins. He tells about how part of the city government was in favor of the sit-ins, but other parts weren't. And the rule was, if just one legislator shows up and they don't want them to protest, they have to shut it down. Okay. So the sit-ins, those guys, they tricked them. They never showed up for lunch. They showed up at 10 o'clock one morning, 4 p.m. the next day, 2 p.m. the next day. They, had never, they were never stopped because no one protested because they couldn't figure out the time of the real protest. This cleverness stopped segregation at lunch counters. And the movement went on to drinking fountains and, and buses. But it was their cleverness that made it work. The outcasts were noticed. Here in scripture, Jesus is very clever. He chooses a woman on the outskirts, a woman who has not paid any attention to because of her lifestyle. But he targeted her for a variety of reasons, it seems. First and foremost, he felt that she deserved the living water that he had to offer. She deserved it. And he gave it to her freely. Second, with her testimony, the townspeople wanted to spend time with him and get to see him for themselves. Third, the disciples got a little lesson out of this. Listen to the part of the scripture one more time. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you've entered into their labor. While the disciples were out looking for food to feed their rabbi, he's there offering food to the Samaritan woman. They went in search of food to buy. Instead, they should have been providing food. What a lesson that these disciples are learning from Jesus. They had wanted to ask Jesus, remember, why on earth was he speaking with this woman and a woman? And they wanted to ask the woman, what was she seeking? Turn of events here. The woman didn't know what she was seeking. In fact, God was seeking her. Jesus sought outcasts. Last week, we had a visitor in the sanctuary after a wedding on a Tuesday morning. I didn't think about locking the doors at all because there was a lot of traffic going in and out. They were going to their cars for flowers and all kinds of doodads. Imagine my surprise. At the end of the wedding, a man comes in the door with a long beard, long hair, and carrying a very, very large duffel bag army issue into the room. All my red flags went off. I approached him quickly and placed myself between him and the other people cleaning up in the sanctuary. I asked him, can I help you? He replied, my name is Justin. I'm traveling through my way to California and I need some food. I'll work for my food. Even a jar of peanut butter would be a blessing. Here comes that talk about food again. Remember the disciples went in search of food to buy. Instead, they should have been providing food to the Samaritan woman at her village. I asked Justin what he'd like to do for the work, and he said that he noticed a bunch of trash up in the gully, and he'd be happy to pick it up and put it in our trash bins. So I sent him off to do the work, and Kathy and I were in the kitchen with tenant preparing lunch. Thank God it was a wedding. We had food, okay? Now, my red flags went off about Justin when I first met him. It, it all had to do with his bag, not him. But I watched him. He was not protective of his bag in any way. He didn't try to keep it by him, nor did he keep glancing at it in any way. In fact, he left it in the building when he went to collect trash, but offered to keep it outside away from the building if it was in the way. So when he came back, I sat with him for about 30 minutes and asked him about his life. It was sorrowful. Justin had been a soldier. He'd been out for seven years wandering 
for seven years. He was hit by an IED and was severely injured. He showed me some of the scars. So he'd suffered a lot of physical damage to his body, but also I believe he had suffered severe mental trauma from this and probably PTSD. He said he'd been arrested in the area five times at churches and put in jail for trespassing. And there's more to the story, I'm sure. But my spidey sense about this, I call it that, my spidey sense, was calm. He was calm. He was grateful. And Ted and I put some money in an envelope and handed it to him because he knew he was going to need more food. And he said, no, I, I, I can't take that. I have to work for it. We went outside and he worked and he collected all the sticks in the yard and he put them in a big, big pile. And he said he would take them to a campground if there was one nearby so they could use it for kindling. This entire experience made me think of Jesus that day by the well. Jesus could have walked on, but he chose to speak to the Samaritan woman. And in some ways, I wonder if God put Justin in our path that day. Was it to remind us to lock our doors? I don't know. More than that, it was a reminder that there are people in this world who are hungry and tired and need a shower and need desperately the living water of Christ. These are the ones we walk by, the ones we're afraid of. Where is the line, I ask myself, between helping and putting ourselves at risk? And since this incident with Justin, I've been struggling with this. I know that his story doesn't make a lot of sense. People aren't arrested and put in jail for several days unless there's an altercation of some sort. And probably his PTSD has some flare-ups. I don't know. But spending that one hour with him, I didn't see that. But again, when do we take the risk and reach across the river, go to the other side, and give the living water as the body of Christ? How do we cross the barriers of social injustice and social stigma if we don't reach out our hands? I think we need to reach out. There are so many who are hurting, including those like the woman at the well who probably had not felt part of a community in a really, really long time. Jesus sets an example for us that's amazing, my friends. A boot camp type of surprising hydration. And as we close, let's listen to the woman at the well. I am a woman of no distinction, of little importance. I am a woman of no reputation, save that which is bad. You whisper as I pass by and cast judgmental glances, though you don't really take the time to look at me or even get to know me. For to be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known. Otherwise, what's the point in doing either one of them in the first place? I want to be known. I want someone to look at my face, not just through two eyes, a nose, a mouth, and two ears, but to see all that I am and could be, all my hopes, loves, and fears. But that's too much to hope for, to wish for, or pray for, so I don't, not anymore. Now I keep to myself, and by that I mean the pain that keeps me in my own private jail, the pain that's brought me here at midday to this well. To ask for a drink is no big request, but to ask it of me, a woman unclean, ashamed, used, and abused, an outcast, a failure, a disappointment, a sinner. No drink passing from these hands to your lips could ever be refreshing, only condemning, as I'm sure you condemn me now, but you don't. You're a man of no distinction, though of the utmost importance, a man of little reputation, at least so far. You whisper and tell me to my face what all those glances have been about, and you take the time to really look at me, but don't need to get to know me. For to be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known. You actually know me, all of me, and everything about me, every thought inside and here on top of my head, every hurt stored up, every hope, every dread, my past, my future, all I am and could be. You tell me everything. You tell me about me. And that which is spoken by another could bring hate and condemnation, Coming from you brings love, grace, mercy, hope, and salvation. I've heard of one to come who could save a wretch like me, and here in my presence you say, I am he. To be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known. And I just met you, but I love you. I don't know you, but I want to get to. Let me run back to town. This is way too much for just me. There are others, brothers, sisters, lovers, haters, the good, the bad, the sinners, the saints, who should hear what you have told me, who should see what you have shown me, who should taste what you have given me? Who should feel how you forgave me? For to be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known. And they all need this too. We all do. We need it for our own. Amen. Mm. 
Now comes the time in our service where we ask for prayers for people, prayers of joy, prayers of